Jackson Chapel. Like Brother Young I always say, Brother Wyatt, it's good to see your face in the place. <laughs> always good to see you. It's, and it's a blessing just to be able to be in the place Amen. this morning. Amen. We ought to give God all the honor Amen. and the glory. We welcome all of you who may be viewing via Facebook or by other means. We pray for your blessings during this holiday season also. And since we're talking about blessings, let us begin with a word of prayer. Gracious Father, again, we come before your presence with thanksgiving in our heart, thanking you for all of the wonderful blessings that you have bestowed upon us. Thank you to God for waking us this morning, for starting us on our way. Thank you that our little families was doing along very well. Pray that you would look beyond our faults and continue to supply all of our needs. For we need you every day, every hour, and every second. Without you, we can do nothing but fail. We pray for your blessings upon Jackson Chapel Church and upon every church that stands open in your holy name. We pray for your blessing upon the sick and pray that you would comfort all of the bereaved families all over the world. Bless the oppressed to God. And we pray that your judgment will be on those who are the oppressors if they fail to repent. We pray for your blessing upon every nation, kindred, people, and tongue upon the face of the earth, for we all stand in need of a blessing. And as always, we pray to God for this Sunday school session of our worship service. We pray that as always, you would be our teacher, leading God us in the way that you would have us to go. We ask it all in the sweet and precious name of Jesus and for his sake. Amen. 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 We're still in our one accord, unit one, God prepares the way. Our devotional reading this morning will be coming from John chapter 1, verses 29 through 42. John chapter 1, starting at verse 29. Reads as follows. The next day, John sees Jesus coming unto him and saith, <clears throat> Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he whom I said, After me cometh a man which is preferred before me. For he was before me. And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come baptizing with water. And John bare a record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. And I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending, and remaining on him, the same is he which baptized with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bare a record that this is the Son of of God. Again, the next day, after John stood and two of his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and saw them follow him, and said unto them, What seek ye? They said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, being interpreted master. Where dwellest thou? He said unto them, Come and see. They came and saw where he dwelt, and abode with him that day. For it was about the tenth hour. One of the two which heard John spake and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first finds his own brother Simon and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus, and when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of John. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. <clears throat> May God have a blessing for the reading of his word for the edification of our souls. Our lesson today, printed text, will be coming from Luke chapter 3, verses 2 through 6. Our subject today is 
John prepares the way. My Sunday school commentary is John the Baptist appears. But we're still talking about John. <clears throat> Our key text today, Luke 3, 3, he came into all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sin, Luke 3 and 3. Now, all four Gospels tell the story of John the Baptist, a forerunner of Jesus Christ. He said, be careful not to confuse him with John who wrote the Gospels that bears his name. So this is a different John. The Gospels describe John the Baptist and his preaching as coming in the type of Elias, that is, Elijah. John came as the last prophet of Israel. As such, his task was to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. We talked about that last week. To make ready a people prepared for the Lord. God called John. God prepared John. And God sent John to prepare the people. I, I thought about it. I said, well, God prepared a man to prepare the people to meet himself. That's what he did. He prepared John to go tell the people to get ready because I'm on my way. I'm about there. <clears throat> Luke stated that, that the narrative of John the Baptist in today's text occurred in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar. Now, Luke names the peoples here. It's not in our lesson text, the first verses. He said he named Tiberius Caesar, and Pontius Pilate, and Herod, and Philip, and Lysanias. These were the political leaders of the region where Jesus lived and served. And then he named Caiaphas and Annas. These were the religious leaders of Judea in the period of Jesus. Caiaphas was actually the high priest, but his father-in-law, Amos, the patriarch of the family, was the real influence among the priestly class. <clears throat> so why did Dr. Luke include all of this? To give us more than a date, he gave us the political setting the setting that was going on when Jesus and John the Baptist come on the scene. The political leaders were corrupt. And if you notice, it said the high priest was Caiaphas and Annas. They had two high priests. According to the law, there's only one high priest. Uh, you, don't, you don't have two of them at the same time. And they come from the descendants of Abram, Abram's family, really, the high priest. And so you have one, but since they are under Roman oppression, the Romans, if you don't care if you was a high priest or whoever you was, if you wasn't holding things down and going according to their system, they would influence another one to come up and they would install another one in your place. So the positions, the priests, the political leaders, they were all bought and sold at this time. You could buy yourself a position if you had the money. Uh, this, this is the environment that John is coming in and that Jesus was coming in. Did that give you an idea of what's going on today? Look at our political leaders. It's nothing about the, the gospel or the law. It was all about positions. And that's the setting that the lesson is in today, <clears throat> the political. Everybody, and I'll say everybody, I mean, as a whole, it's just corrupt. Everything is just corrupt. Yeah. Been 400 years, and here comes John on the scene, and <clears throat> people are just corrupt. And I can't help but why I see what's going on today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's what, this is the environment that John is about to take a part of. 
Since last week, lesson, Brother White taught us that. John was a baby last week, Brother Rock. This week, lesson, I don't know exactly how old he was, but they believe he's between 29 and 30 years old at this lesson. Oh, we can't pinpoint exactly what they said, but this is where we are today. Our lesson picks up at verse 2. Uh, first, I couldn't help but to think that uh, when he was a baby, you know why I told the story how his daddy was, couldn't speak because he didn't believe. And, but, but when he could speak, he told them all about this child. This child is going to be a prophet of the highest and all of this. I just wondered, this is just me, ain't kidding. I wonder how did that old man, that old woman raise that little baby? <laughs> yeah, I wonder how they raised him. I said, I said if, if, if somebody told you this child going to be all of this, and I said, I, I, think, I always think about Robert one day. I said, if, if, if that child comes and says, hey, I want to go out and play with Robert, you ain't going over there with that either. Because <laughs> God said, you're going to be special. So I said, wonder how you raise him. You wonder how Mary raised Jesus. The Bible don't give us all that information when they was little coming up. But they, they were something. But what I do know this, a lot of us say, I knew my child was going to be special. I see some of them, they, when they uh, grow up and they be famous basketball players or something, they say, well, I knew this baby, he's going to be special. Well, when all of our children, we should raise them as though they are, well, not as though, they are special. All of us have a task for God. And so we can all raise our children from infancy on up as though they are special and have a special mission. Because they do. May not be a basketball player and all that, but we all, God has something for all of us to do. So be, I would tell the young generation, raise your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Baby, you got that? Okay. <laughs> Verse 2. Am I the only one who wondered how to... They said Jesus was a good little boy. Now, you, can, you, you can get some books, some more writings that's not inspired that tell you about he's a little bad boy. Now I wonder, wonder what, how he was coming up. You know, how did John the fool? Okay, two big. Verse 2. The word of God came unto John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. Become the word of God. God called. God has prepared him. And God now called him to go about your mission. It, it, it is time, John, for you to be on the road. He came. He came, came to John in the wilderness. Luke 1 and 8 said, And the child grew. That's what got me to think about that baby. The child grew and waxed strong in spirit and was in the desert till the day of his showing unto Israel. So this baby grew and he waxed strong in the Lord and he was in the desert. And I said, so we had two words of thought here. When did he leave his mom and dad and go out in the desert? Almost where they lived in the desert, and the word is called the wilderness. Well, that's okay, but at some point, John went into the desert places, and he stayed until his call. Yeah. In the wilderness, and when I got to think about the wilderness, that's a place where it's not heavily populated. <coughs> that's some people <coughs> in the wilderness, all right, but it's not a city. He's out there, way out in the country. And when I thought about that, then birth, I thought about us. <laughs> John's in the wilderness. God is preparing him. And in the Old Testament and the New Testament, when we are in the wilderness, we may think it's bad, but God is preparing us. Y'all's out there on the mountain, we out there on Dave Martin. God had us in the wilderness, but he was preparing us. <coughs> what he's done. Moses 
went down and killed the Egyptians, and he had to flee. Then he ended up with his father's sheep and things in the wilderness, tending sheep on the backside of a mountain. But God was preparing him. David, he tend sheep, a little run in the family, and nobody cared much about it. He spent all his time out there in the wilderness with the sheep, fighting lions and bears, but God was preparing him. So that's that wilderness experience. Jesus himself had to spend some time in the wilderness. So, so have you ever had a wilderness experience? If you did, God was just preparing you for something. All of us have a mission. All of us have a mission. And if we try to go out to where we live at now, it sure no, it'd be a desert place, a wilderness, because there's nobody out there. And I couldn't wait in case to get up to the city where y'all were. Or something. <laughs> Didn't know that we were blessed out there in the wilderness. God was preparing us for something, but we were, now everybody's in the city, but the town, and it's just like we are home. Everything is corrupt. <laughs> But when we's out there in the wilderness, I go out there now, the farmer put up a sign, they don't even want you out there. You know, they don't even want you out there to go But God prepared us while we was out there. He taught us how to be respectful. He taught us how to appreciate the little things that we had. And so now, when we are thrust out in these cities, we can appreciate God more because of our wilderness experience. And let me leave that alone. So he's, he's out there in the wilderness, and God has told him it's time. Verse 3. And he came into all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sin. So John got his message going. Preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sin. John was preaching <coughs> repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he was preaching as though it is urgent, and it is urgent. For he is at the door and he's knocking. Repent. Now, what does repent mean? You need to turn from all of this wickedness. And be baptized. What to baptize? That's be a show a witness. If you're going to repent and evidence it by someone. You know what he said. So he baptized them and preached repentance for the remission of sin. Now, John is the foreground. And what John is doing is preparing the people. So even the baptism was something that was preparatory. Meaning he was preparing you for something else to come. When he was preaching and teaching this, all of this is preparatory. I'm getting you ready for something else. All right? And we are look at, well, let me leave that alone. We are, we are arguing, fight over baptism <coughs> when that wasn't the message John was trying to get over. John was trying to get over, get your heart ready for somebody who's about to come on the scene and I want you to be ready to receive him. And, then, and he got something in store for you. Yeah. And I'm going to get to that a little bit later. But yeah, I baptize you with water. But don't get tangled up with this water thing. That ain't what it's about. I'm trying to get you ready to meet the Messiah, which is Jesus. Repent. Turn from. You need to turn from your sin. Right. Turn from your wickedness. Go ahead. But the uh, scriptures don't say in the commentary don't say if he didn't go to school, you know, you know, like even Paul went to mm -hmm. Where did he get this? All this came from God as far as in the wilderness, right? In the wilderness. Preparatory. Prepare pan here. Yeah, the the theme of his speech come from God, you know, the repentance stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Get the get the people ready for <coughs> repentance. For the remission. If we can get their hearts ready, John, when Jesus comes, we're going to show you, he's going to show you how your sins are truly forgiven. That's what that remission means, forgiven. The reason I'm adding, because you look at the prophets and all of the poor, they didn't have that thing, no. They had the thing about the Messiah was coming, 
But the repentance part come up when John start talking. Yeah. Repentance is just a term that is used. But you can go back to all the prophets, all the way through scripture, obedience mm -hmm. is taught. So it's, it's the same principle. Okay. They they told you to be obedient. And turn from it. it is the yeah. Yeah. Here they saying repent, which we're on the same level. Okay. Turn from. In the Old Testament, do what God said do. Here, repent. But what is the evidence? Show evidence of it. I made notes here all the way through. I just that sermon last week stayed with me, Pastor. Uh, uh, that Reverend Banky preached. Here, John is telling them believe and behave. Well, you got to repent, be baptized, but you got to behave. You got to act and follow the standards of God. Act like you don't repent. Yes. Okay. You got to evidence. Behave. You do what's right. Believe, because someone is coming, and I want you to believe this. Now I'm gonna baptize you, but this is temporary. Huh? Okay. This baptism is temporary. That coming one that's greater than me. He he he's gonna baptize you with something else. Huh? So that's that's preparatory. It said that the water baptism it didn't just start here with John. It said that when a when a Gentile was converted to Judaism, he had to be baptized. They baptized him then. He said, but what John was doing was kind of different. It wasn't different, but John was telling the Jews and the Gentile to be baptized. And the Jews said, wait a minute, we're already in the family. Mm -hmm. And John said, I don't care. Mm -hmm. you, you may think you're in the family, but you need to repent just like everybody else, and be baptized. You need to believe and you need to behave. You need to evidence it. You need to bring forth fruits, meat for repentance. Mm -hmm. That's coming up. That's what when they went out to see what's going on with that crazy man out there doing what he was doing. Right, so that's it's a lot in there. John baptism prepared his audience to receive God's mm -hmm. coming salvation. He said, I'm, I'm preparing you. Because salvation is on the way. Uh, now, when I started out with all these political leaders, and that Jesus come on the scene, they was waiting on this Messiah to come and free them from all that stuff. John goes out there preaching. Yeah, he, he's on the way. But, and, and salvation is on the way. But it's not going to be what you expect. He's not going to save you from the Romans. He's going to save you from your sins. He's going to forgive you for your sin, for that's what has you in bondage, not the Romans. Sin is what's killing you, and that's going for everybody. So that's what John <clears throat> is preaching, his baptism. The act of baptism served as a tangible and outward presentation of an inward change of heart. But since John's baptism of repentance was preparatory in nature, believers who received that baptism needed to be baptized again. So where did you get that from? Oh, well, in the book of Acts, <clears throat> they run across some of John's disciples in Acts chapter 19. And Paul asked them, have y'all received the Holy Ghost since you believe? He <laughs> said, we, we ain't know if no such, we ain't heard of no such thing as the Holy Ghost. <laughs> he said, he said, well, John, they said, well, he said, what baptism were you baptized in? He said, we were baptized in John's baptism. He said, well, John often baptized you, telling you that there will come one mighty after would baptize you with something else. He said, they said, well, hey, well, what are we going to do? He said, you just believe and be baptized in the name of Jesus. And, and that's what they did. So, so that if we don't argue over the baptism, not the first one, John was preparatory. That don't save us. But that second one, you, you got to have it. Okay. Hmm. Since John functions 
was to be Christ's forerunner, so also his baptism prefigured a different baptism. So he was the forerunner for Christ, preparing the way. His baptism also was preparatory, preparing for something else to come. Uh, and again, I said we fight on baptism. And in the book of Acts, chapter 15, verse 1, they said, except you be circumcised after the death of Moses, you cannot be saved. So they got to fight and argue over circumcision. And we argue over baptism. And we missed the whole message. It's all about Jesus Christ. Salvation is through Jesus Christ. Not through these rituals. Rituals all the way through the Old Testament, all the way up to that. Rituals, the law was our schoolmaster to point us to who? Christ. All the rituals were supposed to be pointing us to this event that's coming of Christ. That's what they're for. And we pick up on the literal and we miss the spiritual. Y'all are just so quiet. Mm -hmm. Verse 4. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah, the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. It's written. John was baptizing and preaching repentance for the remission of sin in his faith. Just as Isaiah was preaching. He's the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord. It said that in Isaiah, that's found it in Isaiah 40. When he was teaching this, or preaching this, or prophesying this, he was talking about make way for God, prepare the way. For he's going to bring the Israelites back home. They had been disobedient. They had been taken off into Babylon. And, and then and the Persian had them and all that. And so Isaiah is saying, God is about to bring his people home. Prepare. Get ready for him, birth Because make, make his path straight is coming up. Uh, he's going to bring, and he's going to restore them back into Jerusalem. He's going to rebuild the wall. In other words, he's going to save them. Uh, so if, if he did it back then, the political leaders think now that he's going to come in and do the same thing with these Romans. But uh, John come preaching that. I mean, Luke quoted that reference and applied it to John. But John is preaching something a little different. He is the one of one crying in the wilderness. They, they applied that prophecy to John the Baptist, saying, prepare the way of the Lord and make his path straight. And that's exactly what John was doing. Out in the wilderness, preaching and teaching and telling people, get ready. Uh, ooh, this one of the preachers always said, get ready, get ready, get ready. That's what, <laughs> that's what John That's what John did. Prepare the way. Make his path straight. John was just then get your heart ready. Get yourself together. For there is somebody about to come on the scene. And I want you to meet him, believe him, and accept what he has to say. Getting him, getting the people ready. Uh, John was the one crying in the wilderness. Preaching a message of repentance, forgiveness, and baptism. He proclaimed a message of hope to prepare the peoples to repent and accept God's redemptive work. Uh, he wants you to repent. And God is going to save you. Uh, but it's not going to be from the wrong. I want you to repent. That's what John was teaching. In verse 5 he said, Every valley shall be filled, every mountain and hill shall be brought low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough way shall be made smooth. Ooh. So, well, what is they really trying to get over in these verses? Oh, wow, that was kind of hard for me. <laughs> <laughs> but 
But we know that if a king was coming to visit back in that day, uh, they would have a servant. And they would go out and they, whatever his path going to require, whichever road he going to come in on, they would go out and they would move anything that's going to bump that chariot that he rides because the king ought to be comfortable. So if it was a ditch, they had to fill it in. If it was a high flame, they had to bring it down because they had to make it smooth. And John said, that's John's job. He's out there to make the valleys and the hill. In other words, preparatory. They are preparing for the king. And John is out here preaching and teaching well, see, what he's doing is preparing the people to be ready to meet the king. Mm -hmm. Be prepared, prepared to be ready to meet the Savior, the one who is going to really free you, who's really going to bring salvation to you. Uh, he's going to free you from the prison house of sin. So get ready, get ready, get ready. It's what John was saying. All four Gospels accounts quote this section of Isaiah 43. But all four of them don't quote the rest of the verse. The one we just talked about. Making every valley should be filled and every mountain and hill should be brought low and the crooked should be made straight. This is what John was doing. It said the metaphor of land being filled and brought low is an image of the humility, humil humbling nature of repentance. Yeah. What he's saying, Bertha, is if it's a mountain, you bring it down. If it's a valley, fill it in. If it's crooked, you make it straight. I said, that's preparatory. Matthew 7, 13, 14 said, Enter in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many there be that go therein, because straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leads to life. And few there be that find it. Uh, again, believe and behave is what he's saying. If it's a crooked place, make it straight. Uh, for straight is the way that leads to life. There's some crooked leaders in this day and time in John. Uh, I told you when I started out, it's a political thing. And it was just some crooked stuff going on. Make it straight. If, that, if, if, if we got some crooked stuff going on in our life, we need to straighten it up. And that's, that's how we prepare for the Lord. For straightest way that leads to life. And there will be a few that will go in and find it. Mm -hmm. Philippians 2, 13 through 15 says, For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. Do all things without murmuring or disputing, that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom you shine, as lights in the world. <clears throat> Don't be mumbling and complaining. That's what this crooked and perverse nation is doing. He said, but and you live in a but you but you're gonna straighten out your ways that you can be a light. That's what he wants to be. We don't need to act like the peoples that we are around. He said, it's a crooked and perverse generation. And we're living in one. But we need to get on the straight road. Uh, we need to, and, and we need to help other people. That's what John has done. John is helping other people to see the light. And that's what we need to be doing. Help other people say, that, that's a better way. <clears throat> Repent. is what John was telling. Turn from. Believe. That's, that's the message. Verse 6, all flesh shall see the salvation of God. All right? If you uh, make the mountains, bring them down. And that mountain can be, uh, you'd have got a little bit too high. <laughs> so, you know, 
you, know, you need to humble yourself. Sometimes we get a little too big for our own britches. Right. But then sometimes we get so depressed, somebody need to help talk to us and bring us up. And John, John, that's what John said. We need to prepare people to meet their Savior. All flesh shall see the salvation of God. Matthew used that term salvation. All flesh shall see the glory of God. Salvation is from the Septuagint, and Matthew says glory. It is a universal salvation for all who repent and believe. Everybody's going to see it. It's salvation. But everybody will not receive it. Why? Because I just quoted a scripture that says, straight is the gate and narrow is the way. And there will be few that find it. Because some people just will not accept John's teaching. And they will not accept Jesus' for teaching. Uh, even though they're trying to make the way smooth and getting them ready for it, they still reject. Everybody, Jews and Gentiles, salvation is for everybody that believes. Even brothers, yeah. yeah. It's for everybody. But everybody just won't believe and behave. But that's what it takes. Now I text jumps to verse 18, to verse 15. <clears throat> but in between John was preaching, verse 7 through 9, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they come out to see what this crazy man was doing out there. Uh -huh. And he, when John saw him coming, he said, oh, generation of vipers, who had warned you to flee from the wrath to come, bring forth fruit, meat, for repentance. Well, again, he said, believe and behave. You know, y'all come out here and bring forth some evidence mm -hmm. if you want to be baptized. Yeah. And then he, he, before they even got to the point, he said, and don't say that we have Abraham. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I don't need to hear that. He said, because God is able to raise up these stones, children of Abraham. You got to repent. You ain't going to just be born into this. It is, it's upon every individual to repent and behave for the remission of sin. So John didn't, didn't bag off from anybody. At the end of the lesson, that's going to get him in trouble. But <laughs> when he saw he called them snakes and vipers. You know, that's, verse 7 through 9, that's not in our lesson text. And then verses 10 through 14, which is not in our lesson text, a crowd came tax collectors and soldiers, and they all asked him, hey, what must we do then? Now I think the question was, what must, we do? what must we do to get this salvation, to be saved, to be free from our sin, to be free, pure? And so they asked John that question. The crowd asked, what must we do? What must we do? He said, hmm, have compassion. Have compassion. If you have two coats and somebody calling and needs them, give them one. If you got food and you share it, have compassion on people, on poor people. Let me tell y'all something. I know the United States can't let everybody across the border, but somebody ought to have some compassion. I just feel sorry. You know? That's what he, that's what John told these people. Y'all need to have some compassion. You wanna know what to do? So the tax collection, I mean, what must we do? What do you tell the tax collector? Yeah, quit robbing the people. <laughs> you know, I'm just, you know, do your job, but whatever Caesar said, take, and that's what you take, but don't take so much you're trying to enrich yourself. Just do what's right and fair. Okay. That's why he, did. he didn't back off, and then here come the soldiers. What, what, what must we do? And he told them, don't abuse your authority. Don't, don't, just accept your wages. Don't go out threatening people to call them shaking. Don't shake people up because you have this power and this position. Do believe and behave. That's what he tell me. Y'all know how to behave when, when we was children and we go going somewhere and they dad would tell Y'all behave. Because <laughs> we have to behave. Believe and behave. That's what John's telling these people. 
Y'all believe in the one that's coming after me and repent. Turn from all this crooked stuff. That means behave. Do what's right. Follow the standards set by God. Repent. What would we do? And, then, and so he was preaching and it was so powerful. We get to verse 15. And the people, and as the people were in expectation and all men mused in their heart of John whether he were the Christ or not. So they looked at him and they thought deeply about this and they meditated on it and they pondered in their heart on it. Who is this guy? You know, that's it. And I can imagine some of them say, birth of it. Well, you know, his mom and dad was priests. Yeah. And you know, his dad couldn't talk. Yeah. And when they named that boy, that dad, that dad started prophesying. <laughs> you know, hey, who is this guy? Reckon this be the Messiah. There's something about him. They said that he's going to be a great child. Yeah. A prophet of the Most High. They said, well, I don't know. It's something about him. So they began to think of their heart. Reckon is this the Messiah. Right? He's the one that's going to free us. Hmm. In John 1 and 19, where I read from our devotional reading, <clears throat> it said that the priest, the Jews sent some priests out and Levites from Jerusalem, and they told them, go out there and find out who this man is. And they went out. <clears throat> they said, we can sit out here and find out who you are. Now, who are you? <laughs> and he confessed and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. John just come out plainly and said, I'm not the Christ. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? Are you Elijah? He said, no. Are you that prophet? He said, no. Then they said unto him, then who are you? We got to give an answer to those who sent us. What sayest thou thyself? John said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. In other words, John told him, I'm just a nobody trying to tell everybody about somebody who can save anybody. So John, I ain't nobody. I'm just trying to tell everybody about somebody. He is the voice of one crying in the wilderness. He is a herald, a preacher, an evangelist out there crying in the wilderness. I think we need to be crying and preaching this same message to people. But this is a different one. John is saying he is here. We are preaching that he's coming again. Uh, we need to get the people prepared for he is coming back. And he's coming back for his church. So we need to be like John. We have the opportunity to present itself. We need to let people know that he is coming back. He's already done the work for us. Now he's coming back to claim his own. Those who listen to this message of John and listen to the message of Jesus and those who believe and behave, he's coming back for you. 16a. <clears throat> John asked and said unto them, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I come into whose latches I am not worthy to unloose. He said, I ain't the Christ now. I, I, I'm just trying to prepare y'all for one that's coming. I just baptized you with some water. This is just a ritual. It is trying to point you to the one that's coming after me. I'm just a voice crying, preparing the way for this one that's coming. After me. There's one mighty than I. And I'm not worthy to loose the latches from his shoe. I looked at one commentary and it said that even a servant wouldn't stoop so low to remove your shoe. They said, hey, that's, that's two submissive. I said, oh, I don't know about that. But that, that is the job of a servant. You know that Jesus washed feet. So he was teaching them, but well, you need to humble yourself. Uh, John saying, I'm not even worthy to remove his sins, to even <laughs> loose the strings. I'm, I'm not worthy of that. 
John did not consider himself worthy to unloose the sandal of the coming Messiah. He considered himself too lowly for the honor of the task of Jesus. He was humble. Now, I thought of this. John could have acted proud. Yeah. Right after John. Now, John could have said, Brother Wyatt would say, Y'all know who I am? <laughs> My dad and mama was a priest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, 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 and I was filled with the Holy Spirit from birth. I know your mom, mom and dad tell you how about me. And I preach. And I preach the gospel because God has given me this message. See, some of us, we like to put ourselves up. John could have done this and would have just about been telling the truth on some of the stuff. He said, I'm a prophet of the Most High. That, that's true because John told him that. But John showed humility. But y'all know that's how we get Jim Jones and all that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. Because God has blessed some people and then they take all that blessing on themselves and show out. John said, I ain't he. It's not me. He knew what they was thinking too. And I'm not the one. We have to be careful to give God the honor and glory. Sometimes they think, oh, I forget that. Sometimes we, we get the same and people come up and tell us, boy, you sure did a good job. Sometimes, well, well to God be glory. Because we have to be careful to start giving God the glory for the thing that he do through us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's why it's always careful to do that. It's, I'm just preparing you. I'm just an instrument. Why I thought about also when you were talking about the pastor and he tell you before service today, you know, play some soft music for the people to run around talking and doing all of this stuff. You know that that's preparatory. Mm -hmm. That's preparing the people to get ready for worship. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, don't, 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 uh, <laughs> I didn't say that. Mm -hmm. But there's a time when we come in, yes, I hadn't seen any Kate all the week. I'm going to talk to any Kate, so I'm going to get it. That, that's going to be some talking going on. But a certain point, when the music start playing and all that, now he's telling us, okay, now y'all going to meet and greet. Now let's get our hearts ready for worship preparatory. This is what John is doing. John is saying, uh, let's now get ready because the Savior is on the scene. Be prepared to meet him. That's what we're doing in the service. We prepare to meet the Savior, to hear the word from God through singing, through prayer, through the preached word. We have to get our hearts ready. Now, we should be ready before we leave, but I'm talking home. But I'm talking about when we get here and greet one another. And there's nothing wrong with greeting one another. You should do that. But at a point, then we need to get ready for worship. Wow. 16b said, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And we've talked on this for many occasions. It said the Holy Ghost and with fire. So this is talking about two baptism. Some saying it's talking about the same baptism. Well, they can be talking about both. Some say this baptism with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And some say, well, I was there on Pentecost and the cloven tongues, I guess, a fire came down. Well, that's, that's okay. We can, we can, we can, you can throw that in there. But, uh, it, technically, we really believe it's talking about two baptisms. Fire purifies. So, you know, that's, that's good. It, it goes both ways. Fire is a tool for creation or destruction. On one hand, the fire to which John referred could point to the visible representation of God's spirit at Pentecost. It could. In the sense, in this sense, fire indicates the establishment of an expanded people of God. But on the other hand, Luke frequently refers to fire as a tool of divine punishment. Considering what follows in verse 17, this fire is likely one of judgment. That's what it said when we get to the next verse. So we're talking about Jesus going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost. That's what he told them in Acts 19. They said, have you ever, have you, have you received the Holy Ghost? I mean, we ain't heard no such thing. They said, well, we need to teach you about Jesus then. And they baptized them in the name of Jesus. And they received the Holy Ghost. So 
John was baptized with water, but they were baptized again with the Holy Ghost. Talking about this fire for a minute. And then by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. So John 15 and 6 said, If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and withered, and when men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. I said, Whoa, okay. Malachi 4 and 1 said, Behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud and all that do wickedly shall be stoned. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts. That it shall leave them neither root nor branch. Believe and behave. If you fail to behave, there are consequences. Okay. Verse 17. Now verse 16, he said, He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Verse 17 said, Whose fan is in his hand, he will thoroughly purge his floor and will gather the wheat into the garments. But the shaft he will burn with unquenchable, with fire unquenchable. Yeah. So this is talking about punishment. Now he's going to gather the wheat, but the shaft will be burned. He said whose fan is in his hand, that's, a, that's an instrument that he used to, to toss this wheat and stuff up in the air and the grains would fall to the floor and the shaft would blow away and they would clean up the shaft and burn it. Mary, oh, be careful. <laughs> no. All of us, John said, we all need to be careful. I didn't come up on, I come up through the grind and corn and stuff. We never had to deal with the wheat. Y'all had to deal with the wheat. We did the peas. Really? Oh, we peas. did the peas. Mama put out the sheep and the owl would blow the shaft and the peas would fall down mm -hmm. on the... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> I saw them going out there with those sickles on, on movies and things. They cutting their tweed and stuff and, and all that. I said, oh, yeah, I didn't come up through that area. So. But these people know exactly what he's talking about. Yep. Yeah. All right, mm. The Messiah, look at the one who separated. It is the Messiah. He, he is the one that's doing this. It, it is, what did it say? Whose fan is in his hand. He is the one who will do the separating. It's not our job to try to separate that, that, that's his job. He's going to separate the wheat from the shaft. And he's going to one do the judging. So we don't need to be trying to <coughs> separate people. Because we don't have a heaven or hell to put them in. But the Messiah will do that. He will be the one to divide the truth from the false and separate the wheat from the shaft. That's what winter is. In Matthew chapter 13, verse 28, it said that a farmer went out and sowed some seeds, and somebody went and sneaked and put some tares in there. And so when the seed came up, and there come these tares coming up in it, and they said, hey, didn't we plant this with good They said, he said, ah, an enemy has done this. They said, do you want us to go out there and pull it up? He said, no. Let them grow together. At the end, I, I'll do separate. Yeah. And me and Mr. John Dane, we, <laughs> we used to get on this verse a lot. He just get on it too. Leave them folks alone. The Bible said, <laughs> when you know, Pam, me and Pam, we got a little rough that time. It was John Day. Leave them alone. The Bible said that we can tell the world together. You leave them alone. God will want to do the same. That's, what you, that's a little bit of truth to that. That is right. Okay. But but it don't mean that everybody get away with everything they want and don't come from it. But that's just what it's saying. Okay. And I'm about to run out of time, so I'll just leave that alone. Let them grow. But there's going to be a time when God will separate. Then I tell you that we have a message like John. We need to be telling people that he's coming back. And, and then when he comes back, it's going to be with judgment. And there's going to be some separation going on. He's going to wheat from the tear. So we need to be telling people that, Reverend Bankhead, I can tell them, we need to believe and behave because he's coming back. And he's coming back for his church without spot 
uh, wrinkle. And many other things in his exhortation preached he unto the people. So John preached all of this stuff. And he didn't cull nobody. He didn't care if he was popular or uh, if he was low. John preached the gospel. John told everybody, you need to repent. You need to change your ways. Yeah, if you're too high up, you need to humble yourself. If you're too low, you listen to it. Jesus will lift you up. That's what we need to be telling people. One more thing I said, his mouth will get him in trouble. He uh, told Herod about that woman you got. <laughs> you know, he, didn't, he, didn't, he didn't bag off him either. He said, you know, got your brother's wife, something like that, and that's, that's just wrong. That's all he told him was, it's just wrong. And that caused him his life. Uh, but God wants us to stand. If we stand for nothing, if we don't stand for something, we'll die for nothing. So, so you got to make a stand. Right? I mean, it's a way to do it, but we just got to stand on the principles of God. And, and it cost a lot of these people. John got them the eye of patents because of his mouth. Because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. So people may not love you when you tell them the truth, but we must tell the truth. John had wide about three years. He said he had one year of preaching. Repent. Be baptized for the remission of sin. They'll come by someone by after me. Repent. And then he had two years he was in prison. And that ended his whole story. Sure. Yeah. It, it said the most, they said it was three years. And the most of his preaching was about one year in teaching. Because the rest of the time he was in prison. But God will bless him and has blessed him. So all of that preparatory work, God got him ready. He had one task. To make people's heart ready to receive the Messiah. John said, I must decrease and he must increase. That's our job too. I want to end right there saying, that's our job is to prepare people to meet the Savior. Since we know about it, and that's good, now we need to be sure that we prepare other people to meet the Savior. Any questions are coming, and we are out of time. But we always make time for coming. Any questions? So you know that you have a mission too, just like John, right? Yeah. Every opportunity to present itself, we need to let the people know he's coming back. And he's coming back for his church. And his church is those who believe and behave. I'll be right there. Let's pray. God, as we wait for Jesus' return, show us how to prepare others to receive your salvation. Help us be attentive to the working of your spirit in our wilderness. Help us to prepare others to meet you. In the name of Jesus, we do pray. Amen.